who owns the East Marsh, because that's the key to all of this, I think. And there's a lot I could say about that. I'd like to get Guy Shrubsoll here and write a book about the East Marsh because there's so many things and it's so kind of indicative of the problems that are caused by the community itself not owning its own neighbourhood. And I think that's the key point. So in, I'll just talk about one thing in particular. In the early 2000s, our council sold off its entire housing stock, uh, mainly to a couple of quite remote uh, housing associations, but also to lots and lots and lots of what are now absentee landlords. So this kind of um, casino capitalism where people on the internet could just buy stuff from a place they've never heard of because houses are a good investment, aren't they? Um, so this is about prioritizing exchange value over use value in houses. And what it leads to is all of these people, and they're not necessarily bad, awful, evil people, they've been encouraged to do this by the culture, and it's a sensible move on their part, but they've never been to the East Marsh. And they give management, if you can call it that, of these houses over to often disreputable um, housing agents. And the conditions are shocking. And some of these landlords, these absentee landlords who live all over the place, you know, all over Britain, all over the world, in fact. We've got one across the road, lives in Italy. Nice. Um, so some of these landlords get trapped into negative equity. And so when their houses fall empty, they get boarded up. And of course, that's a blight on our neighbourhood. But they're just left. And this is that broken windows idea. It just looks like nobody cares for this place. And it says come on in, take over, and of course they did. Um, so tenants' concerns are very rarely addressed and dangerous and unhealthy conditions just don't get fixed. And what people do when they end up in a situation like that, not my house, I'll go somewhere else. And they do a moonlight flip, and I can't blame them, but they leave the furniture behind to get out quickly and the next people that come in hire a big white van with their furniture, all hopeful for their new place, and it's full of furniture. So they chuck it out, and it ends up on the streets, in the alleys, and it just goes on and on and on, this kind of churn of people. So last year, well, three or four years ago, uh, our council's housing department managed to secure £200,000 from Homes England and helped us to set up a project around empty homes. Um, and working with locality, we bought and refurbished three houses. In 2020, three families moved in. They were like little palaces, really beautifully done. And here's something that doesn't sound significant, but is. Those three families are still in those houses. So that's three years later, and this books the whole trend for the whole of the East Marsh, where the churn is just, you know, people just up sticks and off. So last year we raised half a million pounds in a share offer as part of our generational 100 houses for 100 years. We've spent most of that. We've got another five houses which we're about to do up. But interestingly, we thought we were in the game when we did the share offer and everything. And after our experience with the council, we thought we were in the game of buying up empty homes and doing them up and getting people in, bringing things back into use. But actually, we discovered as house buyers some hidden mechanisms that only people with money to buy houses get to see. So houses, investments, get sold off in big job lots. And they go from auction to auction. This is hidden. Um, and you can still see on the internet right now a 47-bedroomed house on Rutland Street for just over a million pounds. And there's a picture on the website of a little terraced house there. You think, well, how does that work? Well, it's 15 houses. And they're all, you know, like a cardboard box at a car boot sale for a fiver. You take it home and you see what's in it. That's the principle. And it just goes from auction to auction, accruing value for whoever's selling it on. But um, 
two of those families who were part of one of those deals reached out to us to ask us to buy their house for them. And they were going back to auction. They'd had six landlords in 18 months. And they felt completely unsettled in the world. And this was having massive impacts on their physical and mental health. And they didn't even know who to pay, pay rent to, you know, and it's all well and good. So oh, I'll have a rent holiday, but actually the Section 21's flying around all over the place and you can get evicted. They didn't want to leave the East Marsh. They liked it there. So they reached out to us. And honestly, in all these six years, it was just the most emotional thing when we sat on that ridiculous auction site and actually got both of these houses. You know, it was just an incredible moment. And these families feel now safe, secure, and they are. Um, I'll finish shortly, um, but basically we're also trying to look at um, developing a knowledge transfer partnership with Huddersfield University's Communities Department, um, helping us to look properly at what it is to be an ethical community landlord, which is how we picture ourselves, and about community voice, really, about tenant voice, giving voice to those perpetually silenced people. So, in a way, our housing project is not about housing at all. It's, it's about people, and it's about helping people take active involvement in their homes and their community. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. Um, what an uh, what an incredible what an incredible story and triumph for the community. Um, our next speaker is James. So James is the co-founder of Your Space, a community benefit society and land trust in York um, that locks land into community ownership and builds low carbon, affordable neighbourhoods shaped by the people that live there. Working with cooperative partners, Your Space is developing innovative delivery and ownership models to keep homes affordable and off the open market. So over to yourself, James. Great, yeah, thank you. Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I thought I'd talk a bit about York because we're here and Your Space are in, operating in York. And it's, you know, it's a beautiful city. People that are in the tent who live here know that people that are here visiting can see that you know it's a tourism destination over 8 million um uh, tourists visited last year we um and that puts a lot of pressure on the city um and you know world heritage status pending means that conservation in the city is a big issue so we have a challenge in trying to build any meaningful number of houses or infrastructure because of that not least the fact we haven't had a local plan since 1954 which means any sort of planning to grow the city isn't really mapped out, so we can't do any meaningful proper planning around doing that. I mentioned the tourism, but also it's a student city. There's two universities in the city that puts pressure on housing in the city. Um, and um, just specifically on the on the tourism and the and the holiday let situation, this is an issue for York at the moment. And um, you know, Airbnb, the new kid in town, that's sort of the latest contributor to the housing crisis in the city. It's um, it, you know, and our MP Rachel Maskell is currently um, pushing that agenda to get that regulated because uh, it's a big issue, and um, we need to start thinking about what, you know how have we fallen ourselves, how have we found ourselves falling into a position that houses that could be for families are essentially businesses, and it's unregulated. The numbers are unregulated, and there's a bill going through Parliament currently, which will hopefully help. So the issue around tourism is um, is significant, and it just seems a bit absurd that we allow that to happen when we're it was a distinct undersupply of housing in the city, and there's people that are being driven out of the city. So that tourism, that tourism workforce, people that are key workers, people working in the creative and and uh, industry and artists, people running social enterprises, you know, they 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 the income can their uh, wages barely keep up with inflation, let alone house prices, and you find yourself in a position where all these people are being priced out of the city. So and you know. Don't get me wrong, the housing crisis isn't unique to York and um, anyone from London, <laughs> just ignore these figures, everything's relative. Um, but to sort of give some stats for, for, for York and, and what that means, in 1997, the average house price in York was £80,000. In 2017, it was £246,000. Unless you had an amazing job, your salary was not in, increasing at that rate. And so in 2017, the average um, salary it was 10 times your average salary to buy that average house price in 97 it was four times that 
So we found ourselves into a, into a bit of a situation around this huge levels of unaffordability. Moving forward to now, to, to this year, um, since March 2020, so when COVID first hit, a lot of people moving to York, working from home, commuting to London. Um, the um, house prices rose 41% since 2020. So the average house price in York now is £370,000. Last year alone, 21% rise in house prices meant that like seven, over a period of a year, £70,000 on the average house price in York. And it's just absurd. Like the, the, the second, own, second home ownership and a buy to let market is booming in York. Like um, average rent prices nationally rose by 4% last year. In York, it was 11%. And I'm personally affected by this. So me um, and my young family we were evicted from a house last year, three bed house, um, because the landlady wanted to charge that out for 500 pounds more a month. I now currently live in a two bed house that's costing me 200 pounds more a month than the three bed house. And it, it's just, it's really painful. Like there's people that are basically being driven out of the city. Um, so the, the big issue here is, is how can we tackle that? And, and that really, um, is at the heart of what um, of what your space are, are trying to do here, try and think about different mechanisms in which we can change that. Because the big issue is that there's just mass unregulated financialization of housing. And what that means is when we're thinking about affordable housing, we're not building enough homes for to, to make up, keep up with the, the loss of affordable housing. So in a 10 year period from 2022, from 2012 to 22, we built 619 affordable homes but we lost 663. So that's a net loss of 44 over 10 years. So we're just on an absolute hiding to nothing. And so we need to start thinking differently about tenure. We need to start thinking about differently about how we change our ownership of, of land and houses so that the homes don't become affordable and they stay off the open market. That's, that's the trick. So that's what we're doing at Your Space. So we're a community benefit society. We're a land trust. We're getting land and we're locking it and putting it into community ownership. It's not for sale. And what we're doing is then we're working with our cooperative partners to look at different delivery models, different financial mechanisms, um, different ownership structures to keep the homes affordable permanently in perpetuity and not find their way onto the market. Um, so um, I suppose I um, should talk a little bit about what that means for us. So um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, um, but sustainability is an issue for us too. Um, we think of it as the second of our uh, three stools to, to, to shape what we're doing. So the, the, and getting that balance right with the rule of three. So affordability, sustainability, and the third bit is community, like bringing together people to take on those challenges of, you know, things like the housing crisis or the climate crisis. And, giving people agency and empowering them to take control of the housing situation. I feel like people feel like they've been left behind and the power of coming together really, really helps. But also we'd like to think about housing is not just about building more and more houses. That's not what the trick is. It's building the right kind of housing that people want to live in and that stay affordable permanently. So thinking about the projects that we're working on, um, so Low Field Green is our first project, um, a project that we received planning permission for in 2019. 19 homes, a mixture of one, two, three, and four bed homes, a common house, a community building where the community can come together. We designed in things like shared laundry, um, guest rooms, so the houses didn't have to be too big. They were just modest sized houses. Um, we um, had shared car parking spaces. We designed more outdoor shared space than outdoor private space. That was a positive decision made by the community because they wanted to be a community. And we designed all the homes around one planet living principles. You know, we're, we're trying to basically build a low carbon community in the city. Um, and if that wasn't ambitious enough, um, we're also trying to um, um, trial a new cooperative ownership model for the city. So um, the way that that works, and I'm going to try and do this without any imagery, with any graphs or charts. <laughs> um, so the way that this works is that this is a partnership. So um, I, I must do a big shout out to City of York Council because they've really helped facilitate this project. So this is a partnership between City of York Council, Your Space, the Community Land Trust, but Lowfield Green Housing Co-op who represent the residents. And how this works is that um, City of York Council have sold the freehold of that land to Your Space. Your Space now owns that land, it's in community ownership. And then what Your Space does is lease it to the resident group, to Lowfield Green um, Housing Co-op. The Housing Co-op is a mutual home ownership society. And what that means is that the residents who are members of that organization can accrue equity in the development. The difference being is that residents don't own their home outright. They own it collectively with their neighbors. 
and um what you do is you and, and your house the the your your share or your stake in the in the development is reflects the size of unit that you have so it's quite similar to uh, a typical house where you would put down your 10 percent deposit and pay your monthly re repayments it's akin to that the difference is the individual as part of that court isn't taking the mortgage out it's a collective mortgage that's taken on by the entire community so individuals can't check out when they want to leave and speculate on the value of their shares on the open market the co-op controls and regulates the value of those homes and what that means is if the co-op controls the value of the home doesn't matter what's going on outside in the, in, in the market externally it's, it's just preserved so over time these homes become more and more affordable so how am i doing for time Okay, I'll be quick. Um, so in terms of um, what we're doing, so we ran a community share offer similar to what um, uh, we we're talking about here. We raised £422,000. The community invested. We became, they became members of our organisation. That would allow your space to buy the land. Um, that was in 2019. I think it's a bit of an understatement to say since 2020, when we were ready to go, this, this project has been a real challenge to deliver. We were due to start on site that year. In March 2020, the um, community housing fund was due to be um, renewed in the spring budget. It wasn't. The community housing fund is a Homes England fund that was going to fund our model. It's going to give us capital funding. £900,000 we lost at that point. Um, and the, dif the difference here is that that type of funding, this model, isn't funded by normal Homes England affordable homes programme. So that was the trick for us to get that funding. Since then, COVID, Brexit, the most recent thing is interest rates. Um, it's, it's just, it, it, the costs have just spiralled. And we will be on site this year, but the, the reality is that what we're trying to build isn't going to be as fantastic as we hoped it would be. We still will build something. We will use more commonplace, affordable tenures to bring in grant from Homes England and a bit of cross subsidy so we can build in part some of the homes as that mutual home ownership society. What it will mean is that it's just, you know, things like our our shared facilities and some of our sustainability features they're just they're just a luxury item now they can't be afforded so um so yeah so to sort of finish on an ask i guess um we um we need help lots of people like what we're doing they say it's great what we're doing but no one's funding it and that's the real trick for us is to find funding homes england funding does fund affordable rent shared ownership social rent but they all have the right to buy and right to acquire and those homes find their way onto the open market our model doesn't and that's what needs to change so we need to we need to think about that so i'd like people to think and a bit of a challenge about what people think about abolishing the right to buy is a bit of a is a bit of a sore subject um, but also if anyone's got a million pounds we could really do with that to make our project viable and we've got a stall over there and um, i'll sign my life away so um yeah I'll finish there. Thank you. Okay. You can uh, line up to hand your money to James at the end. He'll just be waiting there. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, James. And so important as well to highlight this, the you know prolific rise of second home ownership and the destruction that Airbnb is causing. I'm sure communities in Edinburgh and Cornwall are going to be feeling very similar. Much of the Highlands in Scotland as well um, has, has experienced a really, really similar situation to that of York. And we can see the devastation that that's happening. It's, it's homelessness. It's housing insecurity. It's eviction notices being served. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. Our uh, final speaker is Melissa. Melissa is the uh, founding director of We Can Make, a neighbourhood tent space in, uh, test space, sorry, tent, went to the brain, um, in Bristol for imagining and making new ways to create homes, build social infrastructure and community wealth, designing and delivering innovative um, approaches to community-led housing. So over to you, Melissa, thank you. Cool, uh, ooh, let's get close to this. Can people hear me? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So Melissa from uh, Knoll West in Bristol, where we can make a set up as a community land trust. And uh, what I think is quite interesting about our, our neighbourhood of Knoll West, a um, hundred years ago when it was first built, it's very much seen as the future of housing. These were homes built hit, fit for heroes in response to the kind of horrors of the First World War. And it's interesting, the, the builders at the time that built our estate, they nicknamed it the 5,000 Island Forest because these were 5,000 homes built on a hill surrounded by greenery. I think it's really important to remember the kind of like the poetry and the kind of radical hope and intent that went with that build. Because a spin on a hundred years later and a lot of outsiders come and look at our neighborhood now with its crumbling public realm and 
high levels of multiple disadvantage and they look at us as a as a kind of problem to be fixed or even demolished and started again and that's wrong that'd be like a massive waste of carbon it'd be a massive waste of social capital and also we know when we scratch the surface of our neighborhood there's all sorts of richness in terms of know-how and assets there and the kind of challenge is it's not to demolish and start again but how do you tap into that energy and know-how to reimagine how we could meet the new needs that are emerging today and we know that those assets in our neighbourhood are rich like they are in all the kind of Grimsby and other places we've been talking about. So, for example, we worked with an artist, Suzanne Lacey, a couple of years ago to create the University of Local Knowledge. And this is 900 videos of community know-how. And it's got everything in it from um, how to set up your own cloud uh, computing system to how to catch and skin a rabbit. And this is just kind of wonderful stuff. And the key is, like, how do you remix that stuff to kind of like meet new needs today? So that's why we're kind of set up as that neighbourhood test space, because we want to work with those assets, those people, to reimagine how we can live better together. Um, so, and land is absolutely one of those assets. So I'm going to talk about in a moment about how we're using land as a site of social innovation and social imagination and trying things out. And our mission is to try things out, make stuff in the West, and then that these things can be useful for other neighbourhoods that are experiencing similar challenges to us. But first of all, you have to look at how land is currently being used. Um, and I think it's interesting, I was in a conversation with um, Leilani uh, Farrar, who was the, she was the UN Rapporteur on Housing and Human Rights. And like her view is very much though that the way that the real estate industry is currently um, set up, it's an extractive industry. And it's got a similar level and scale of harms as other extractive industries like mining, because it's treated in that way, the way that it uses land. And I think, um, you know, and if you look at the UK kind of, uh, you know, mass housing kind of volume builders, then you just have to agree with that assessment. So uh, anyone from Persimmon in the audience? Nope, didn't think so. Not their kind of vibe here. But um, if you look at um, last year, they made over a billion pounds pre-tax profits. A profit, not turnover, profit of a billion pounds. And then the profit on each unit, because they don't build houses, they build units, their profit on every single unit was £74,481 profit. So 26, they're making 26% profit on every unit they build. So you can see it's an extractive industry. And it can't be fine if they were building the houses that we need. Um, but they're not. So you look at a kind of around 200,000 homes were built last year. Of those, just 26% were affordable. And actually, if you want genuinely affordable social rent, only 2.8% of those 200,000 homes were actually affordable. That's 6,239. And it gets worse than that. So, uh, of those 200,000 uh, 200, homes, less than 2% were built to the highest environmental standards. So we're basically building climate liabilities that are going to have to be retrofitted within a couple of years. So that's not good enough. That is like a hideous situation that we're in. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can kind of change the rules. These are rules that we've made and we can treat land in a completely different way. And so land can be, it's our proposition, land can be a site from which you can grow completely different kind of relationships. Relationships that are collective, regenerative and really care about the long term. Um, and so I'm just going to decide like three ways that we can make in Bristol is trying to use land in this way as kind of sites for experimentation and social imagination. So first up, number one, uh, we've developed a new model of um, what we call opt-in densification for community-led infill development. So land, kind of microsites, is in abundance. So access to land for community-led is often really difficult, but actually you've got to look at the land that's almost already in your hands, and this is in abundance. So we looked at all the little tiny plots in big back gardens in between buildings in our neighborhood and found over a thousand. Uh, so where you could put a one or two bedroom home exactly where you need it, where it's most needed. So we call this idea urban acupuncture. So it's whereby people in housing need, whether they be elders who want to downsize or uh, overcrowded families, we've got adult children desperate to kind of get a space of their own. 
Uh, and they can opt in to putting part of their garden into our community land trust. And then we've got a community micro factory where we work with uh, a timber based uh, modern methods of construction. We make the components for the home, build the house, and then they get a home for living rent and lifelong tenancy. Um, and I think it's really we've got we've done and a, the really powerful thing that land assembly and planning permission is uh, entirely conditional on that home and land being affordable and in community ownership forever. So that's a new supply of land for affordable community led homes. So we built two homes so far. Uh, we've got really happy residents living in them. And I think the really interesting thing is, is like, you know, Persimmon would look at the profit they could get out of this. We're interested in the social value that you can get out of this. So all the non-financial returns you get from doing housing in this way. So the carbon saved by building with biomaterials, uh, the, uh, the local jobs made by making the homes locally, uh, the impacts on kind of um, health and reduction in loneliness because you're building relationships at the same time that you're building houses. And we used a couple of tools called Hacked and Toms, which are industry accepted tools for counting up these non-financial returns. And then we counted that just from these two homes, over, uh, no, almost 400,000 pounds worth of social value generated by that. So that makes it from every square meter that we're building out, uh, over 3,600 pounds per square meter in that wider social value. And you know, let me get going. So we've got a pipeline of delivering 150 homes on microsites in our neighbourhood. So that's a new home delivered exactly where it's needed most. And you add that up, that means we've 28 million pounds worth of social value and kind of community wealth delivered in our neighbourhood by building in that way. And then you scale it up and you look at okay, how can this work across the wider country? Because there's lots of places like Knoll West. So over a million uh, low density council built houses were built into war area. And if you did the same level of intensification, about 3% that we're talking about in Knoll West and did that across the country, that would be over 30,000 homes um, built urban acupuncture exactly where people need the most and that could generate over six billion pounds worth of social value and community wealth so you begin to get a sense that this stuff could could scale from lots of small communities doing their their part of things so that's one kind of site of imagination i'm not going to compete with that little pause how long do you think it's going to go on for? A very elaborate two minute warning, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Like, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, two, two other sites of imagination. So the other one is um, front gardens. So in Norwest, over 30% of our front gardens have been turned into car parks. Um, and so we're asking, what if you could reimagine those front gardens and if they could be part of the public ecological and social infrastructure of the neighborhood. So we've been working with an organization called Better Block in Dallas, Texas. I love working with them because they all go y'all in every conversation, which is really great. Um, but we've been developing a flat pack uh, front garden retrofit kit that includes planters, a rocking chair, a library, hedgehog houses, that's really easy to assemble, really easy to install. Uh, so you can retrofit those social connections and those connections with nature back into front gardens. So we're trying those out with a bunch of families in the West and our friends at Civic Square in Birmingham. And they're soon going to be available. That recipe and those designs are going to be available for anyone to freely download uh, anywhere and everywhere in the world. So you can get those from a platform. So that's our second size of imagination. And then the third one is around materials justice. And it's kind of like the really kind of like strong fact that we simply don't have the material budget or carbon budget in the world to retrofit all the homes that we need to and build all the new homes that we need to. It just simply doesn't kind of exist. So we have to be really smart about how we use our land to supply that. So there are, I think there are opportunities here as well. So it's interesting, the UK is the, uh, the world's biggest importer of timber after China which is just astounding really. And then what we do with this, we don't build with it, we burn, burn the vast majority of all that timber that we import. And then it's kind of like insane because you then go, uh, the UK has got one of the lowest levels of forest cover, like, you know, compared, we're at 12% compared to 40% of European average. And you go, hang on a second, we're importing wood to burn and we've got nothing kind of, you know, so what if we could reimagine the land around our towns and cities as the source for biomaterials with which we can build and retrofit with. Um, so again, you know, the kind of scale of reforestation that places like Costa Rica have done, that we could reimagine our land and use that in that way in the UK. So our kind of contribution to this, our next batch of homes, which we're in planning now, 
Just hope we get them. Um, we've set a challenge of them being 100 mile biomaterial homes. So looking at everything from foundations to final fit out, what can we make with what we can source within that 100 miles? And it's super exciting. Like a member of my team was down yesterday uh, with a local kind of sustainable forester felling the trees that are going to be the timber cladding uh, for our homes that we're going to make in panels in our community factory. Just kind of wonderful kind of stuff. So I think it's, so there's our, our three kind of contributions really. And I think my overall message is um, like, we're small, we're one neighborhood, um, but you know, we make no apology for that. And I think, you know, misquoting Michelle Obama, small can be powerful. And I think it's kind of like working with these kind of tools, if they could have a thousand, a hundred, 10,000, a hundred neighborhoods working with a similar set of tools, trying to do this stuff, then we can add up to more than the likes of those kind of persimmons and the mass house builders. And we can demonstrate that, a better future is not only imaginable, but we can actually make it happen on the ground as well. Um, and we've got some workshops and stuff coming up in Norway. So if you're interested in any of this, come and talk to me and come and play with us on the ground. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, right. I'm keen to keen to shift to you guys and hear any questions that you might have for the panelists. We've heard of some incredible, innovative Disruptive, disruptive mechanisms for tackling an unequal and unjust housing system and how land, how integral land is to that. Um, so please raise your hand if you've got a question. If it's for a specific panelist, point to which one it is so that I know who to who to ask. Um, we'll take this question here and then this question here. Firstly, from yourself. Why did you talk by a local? Um, uh, Architect. And the architect said that the whole building of houses owned by a few companies and they've got no interest in building past the houses which will be cheaper and the newer, more renewable um, resources. That they've got it sewn up the building companies. Houses could be cheaper, flat, flat um, other methods. Um, I just wonder what you thought about that. And also, there's an interesting program on the radio about housing and people who come in. One of the things they said, and the digital base, was that the concept of the new nomads, people who can't afford housing, are the rental buy, take to banks, and they call themselves new nomads. And they want very simple facilities, and they find they like living simply. And in Bristol, there's quite a large conurbation of people, and the local authority are having to rethink use of land because of this restrictions, increasing restrictions around travellers generally, these are new travellers, new nomads, and they're having to rethink, which is such an excellent thing. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody on the panel want to respond to that? Um, go for it. Um, yeah, I think there's an industry sort of feeling that um, the sort of um, flat pat um, off-shelf prefab housing is going to solve the housing crisis since the 1950s. I think. I think there's been a um, a bit of a misappreciation of 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 how that could work. And I think the reason that is is because there isn't a will to do it. So as you say, there isn't. So there are the two the tools out there. I mean, the things that Melissa's talking about. If any building company actually did do that, think really realistically about where they could source their materials and can they source them from the country that we're in, we'd we'd find ourselves significantly lowering the carbon impact of our of our house building. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the van thing. So there was a there was a network of people uh, in York that was it's actually I think it made it into the BBC News website uh, York a couple of years ago where people a growing number of people who are being priced out of out of, um, out of rented places, you know mainly people that left uni university recently and just couldn't afford any of the rents but they wanted to stay in the city. That's the other thing I talked about York being a student city. There's not anywhere for us to retain that that talent. There's no there's no opportunities for them. So yeah, that the the, the van dwelling sort of um, I so crowd is 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 popping up in a, f a few places now. So yeah, fantastic. Um, did you want to come in? Right, yeah, briefly on on the point about the sort of developer model. I think it, it's no I mean, the developers don't make it a secret that their business model is to eke out a small number of home homes so that they don't affect this sort of agri the, the house price you know if they flooded the market with all 500 homes they were building suddenly those homes would be worse uh, worth less than uh, they assumed when they bought the land um and you know in their sort of business in their sort of documents to shareholders and things like that they're really explicit about that's what they do the only way really to shift that is um well rely on those 
developers less and diversify the industry and have different people, but also build different types of homes. So if you are, um, it's sort of, you know, our, our sort of house building sector relies really heavily on these big house builders, not even really developers, they're sort of house builders who try to make places. Um, but if you were building more kind of social and affordable housing, more community led housing on that, those same plots of land, you'd be releasing many more homes more quickly. Um, so again, it comes back to that, like who controls the land and all those sorts of questions. Phenomenal. Over to yourself. Personally, um, I'm assuming are a public listed company, which means they shares are owned by a large pension fund and institutional investors who um, give them their incentives. So then these big, big, evil companies are actually owned by everyone in their pension. And they are generating returns for their, their pension. Um, and because they make billion pound profit, they can raise lots more money to scare to build. How can we get you guys to build uh, what else? So, I very, I'm super sympathetic to you, and I think the shared ownership model is the way to go, and localism is the way to go. But the challenge for me and you is how do you scale up? How do you raise the to compete with the persimmons? Uh, um, because you're actually getting much better social, overall social concerns in terms of the economy. And the problem with uh, like shared ownership models, which actually work. Like, so for example, building societies used to be shared ownership models, but then they turned into uh, uh, private vehicles and they went bust in the financial crisis. So it's a system which works, but we've gone the wrong way. We've gone away. So, how do you join up all your local initiatives, which are the way forward, I think, and but also punish like a powerful? Yeah, I think if you don't do that, we fail because we've been 18 phones. You're not going to solve the housing crisis. You need to link up with a million other people who are also building AT coach and be able to scale up it, scale up that way. So it's the, the initial is great on the ground, but that key step needs to be a like the the dog the dominant model. Okay, great. So there's lots of food for thought there, and I think I'll go first to Melissa. Go for it. Yeah, you're right. That is the key challenge. And um, the challenge is how to make all this money that's floating about in global listed markets actually make it into the real economy of people and places. So how do we make that money sticky uh, and actually get down to our kind of level? Because um, this is the social infrastructure that really matters and this is what we need to invest in. So I think I also, as well as we can make, I, I'm part of Power to Change, which is um, a, uh, a charitable foundation that's trying to do exactly this, which is trying to package together at neighbourhood scale and regional scale place-based investment so that we can get all of our kind of like collections of small, you add all together the small and it makes pretty big actually. Um, so I, you know, the next big thing is going to be lots of small things. And what we need to be is smarter of how we package those together so that we, that we can then reduce some of the transaction costs of that money finding us. Um, and so make us big enough so we're visible to the world of global capital because uh, we're here and we're ready and we're really ready to go. So we just need to stitch it a bit closer together. But it feels like we're beginning to get like how we can do this. Um, but what we need is a couple of real kind of demonstration sites on the ground at neighborhood, city and regional scale. So if anyone wants to help make that happen, come talk. Brilliant. Would, would you, yes, you'd both like to come in. Okay, I have been given the been given the five minute warning, which I think is now a four minute warning. So we'll be be quick. You mind I'm very quick. But both go for it. <laughs> so yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Really, the pension system in this country is just broken. Like in terms of when you compare it to the European model, it, we've got really poor pensions in this country. So it, people's homes become their pension, and and so that's a big issue we need to address. Um, I absolutely agree that the 19 homes we're building isn't the silver bullet that's going to fix the issue. I think there needs to be more opportunities for those innovative models to be given, you know, the opportunity to pilot it. That's what this is. It's a pilot. And just as all the other stuff that people are doing, and if those things can be joined up, that will help. But yeah, for me, fundamentally, the, 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 the issue is that we need to think about how we could maybe even, I suppose, destigmatize social housing and in housing that is regulated because that's the issue here a lot of social housing is there is a stigma associated with that if we can change that like our model is basically regulated housing it's very similar to social housing in that respect so if you can change that and make housing more affordable allowing people to save money in a different way rather than 
investing in their homes and i think that will that will help but you're absolutely right the, the pension situation is a big 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 issue and uh, the pension fund thing comes home to grimsby as well into the east marsh because part of the east marsh is our docks and that's owned by allied british ports or abp they used to be goldman sachs and they are now a combination of Singaporean, UAE, and uh, Canadian pension funds. And they feel very remote. And we can't even go on there. They've got a, a, like a gatehouse with a, a guy that's, oh, no, no, no. So it's a very weird situation in that sense. But I'd say, you know, I mean, what we've he heard today here, I just get a sense that we all know, we can see that we're kind of careering down a path that's not going to look good. And we can, we're trying to explore solutions to this. And, and I think it is, there's a cultural shift needed. And I think these are some of the things, it's about shifting power from bureaucrats to citizens. That, that old top-down approach just doesn't work. There's nothing coming from that, it has to be ground level upwards and we have to have trust in people to be the experts in their own lives and when that comes to housing it's about shifting the emphasis from exchange value to use value what it is to have a home not a house as an investment and I'm in line with James here for that million quid, in fact, 10 million, which will sort us out. Go on, let's go bigger, 100 million. Oh, yeah, well, exactly. Million. And it's out let's, there. Let's go let's big or go home. Huh? The new auction. So we got the original well, auction that Billy spoke about, well, I guess. <laughs> the, the thing is, because we're the experts in our lives, we can see, um, you know, there's some amazing things projects that have been put together and they're all about sustainability it's about living in place with people on the planet and like our hundred houses for a hundred years you know we're talking generationally so that when i leave the planet i want to feel sure that somebody else has come along and stepped in and carrying on the work that i've been doing you know so yeah Brilliant. Um, well, York Minster is telling us quite clearly that time is up. Um, so I want to say a massive thank you to you all for being here, to um, to Melissa, to Billy, to James, to Darren for, I think, bringing about such um, brilliant analysis of the deep embedded structural injustices embedded into the land and housing market, but also giving us a glimpse of what's a possible alternative future in terms of you know democratic ownership models and I just want to finish on the point of how we can scale them because I think this has given us so much food for thought and inspiration about how we can reimagine the land and housing market the point about scaling it I think we can learn from some of the failures of the housing market actually as to how to scale this because right to buy one of the most corrosive policies in terms of you know decimating the social housing stock was rolled out at a local level and then scaled very effectively nationally. And so we can probably learn from that. And instead of decimating the housing stock, we can reimagine housing ownership. We can scale community ownership. We can transfer it from a, a, a market that's embedded in, in speculation and speculative investment and asset ownership, rather than being about homes, being about communities, being about providing security for folk, low carbon infrastructure and tackling fuel poverty. So thank you so much again for coming along and please give a round of applause to our speakers.